Hello and welcome. Today we're taking a look at this old Soviet oscilloscope. The part number is C1-49 and uh, and I don't really know who made this. Um, there is a logo down here which says something like CT. But I'm not familiar with the uh, old Soviet uh, factories so I really can't tell. But anyway, the front panel is completely in uh, Cyrillic. But still, with my uh, little bit of uh, knowledge of the Greek alphabet, I probably can spell my way through. So first we're going to plug it in and uh, see what it can do. Yeah, so let's switch it on. There's a high pitch noise. So I guess it's uh, time to lacquer the power transformer or the high voltage transformer. So let's just wait for it to warm up because there are vacuum tubes inside but as you can see there's a nice crisp green line here and uh, it's drifting a little bit but uh, I guess that's because it hasn't warmed up yet so let's connect the sine wave generator there we go and uh, we have some signal here and uh, let's see whether we can Synchronize and there we go. There's, a There's some problem with the trigger, but okay, there we have it. It's a gorgeous sine wave, it's really, really beautiful. I hope it's not too bright on the camera. Uh, if we just go through the controls one by one, the brightness is over here, doesn't make much difference, I think could be something loose and the focus is here as you can see then we have the light for the graticule it's a nice orange color then we have the power switch and a little uh, it's not a it's not an LED it's more like a gas discharge tube of some sort um, but that works okay then we have the Y position and the X position here then we have AC and DC input selection here but basically on the front panel is shown as a symbol with a capacitor and uh, without the capacitor so you can actually figure out what kind of probe you need here but anyway whether it's uh, AC or DC is still one mega ohm input so that's really nice and then we have here this is the the volts per division uh, button and uh, you can also adjust it manually uh, using the potentiometer here that looks like there's a and that looks like we should have some contact spray uh, on this potentiometer. To the right of that, there's the time division, and that runs really well, uh, although it's a little bit um, hard to move. You need to put in some power. Then we have a times one and a times twenty. This is uh, if you want to zoom in on something on your sine wave, and that's a really nice feature. Then if we turn this all the way to the right, we have an X input here, so we can do uh, X, Y on the screen. Uh, down here we have an output, which is a square wave, 500 millivolts. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know whether this works or not, because I don't have a connector that plugs into here. Uh, although it might be just a standard banana plug, I'm not too sure. And then we have down here, this is the sink section uh, basically what we today call the trigger input and from here there's an input here for trigger and uh, we can adjust the trigger level using this uh, this button here then we have here uh, the switch between internal and external trigger and um, I'm not sure why the layout is like that but right now we're putting it on internal trigger meaning we're triggering on the signal coming in on the input here then we have an AC and DC trigger and then we can invert the trigger, uh, what we would probably call a rising edge or falling edge trigger. Then there's a stabilizer button, which is uh, not found on modern oscilloscopes. But yeah, it's definitely a usable uh, oscilloscope and the bandwidth, as far as I know, is up to 5 MHz. That's really uh, still usable today, even though it's, um, I guess, around 40 years old. So anyway, uh, let's switch it off and uh, open it up and see what we have inside.
and I wish you could experience the smell of this oscilloscope. It smells of varnish and old car. It's uh, quite unique. One thing interesting that I found is these little screws here. There's one of them for each panel. And this is the Soviet way of doing a warranty void if opened kind of thing. This cap here is filled with some waxy red material. And the only way you can open up the oscilloscope is by uh, scraping out this wax. That's the way they know whether you have been opening it or, or not. So that's a cool little way of doing stuff. And uh, although not as cheap as uh, today's hologram stickers, I, I like this way better. This is really an old-fashioned mechanical way of doing things. Okay, so I removed the left cover. And uh, I'm not sure whether this is the best way to start, but what we have here is the main transformer here that will convert the 220 volts in from the mains to something in the region of 40 volts. On the other side of the oscilloscope, I will show you later, there are some rectifier diodes, some capacitors, and there's a, a DC voltage regulator and a couple of power transistors. And uh, basically everything will run from uh, the DC voltage generated by that circuit. So what happens is that uh, the 40 volts from that circuit comes to this board here. So basically what happens here is that there's an oscillator and uh, this transformer here that will transform the 40 volts up to the different voltages required on this oscilloscope. So from the output of this transformer, all these outputs are being rectified by this circuit here and we are getting plus minus 50 volts, plus minus 10 volts, 6.3 volts and uh, I think there are a couple of other voltages coming out of this board here. What we also have here on the left is a, a massive switch, it's a, it's a gang of switches actually and it's used to set the times per, di per division. Uh, if you take a look at the schematic you will find that this switch is uh, selecting different capacitor values for the sawtooth generator. And up here we have one of the main PCBs. This PCB handles the trigger input and it uh, handles the generation of the sawtooth for the X uh, deflection. And uh, apart from that, we have the main uh, high voltage uh, circuit uh, hidden inside here. Uh, if you look at the schematic, this is basically just a voltage doubler. A lot of diodes and capacitors really in a voltage doubler configuration. And here we have the other side of the circuit. Uh, basically what we see here is uh, the input circuit. There's a whole lot of uh, trimmers. And, um, and what happens is that the signal comes in uh, from the BNC connector and goes through a lot of resistors and capacitor networks inside here. And basically this is used for setting the correct input impedance for all the different volt per division ranges. Apart from that we have here the input circuit. And uh, actually the first thing the signal reaches after this uh, impedance matching network down here is a vacuum tube. And um, the reason they use a vacuum tube is because all the transistors are bipolar. And uh, to get a really high input impedance, you would either use a JFET or MOSFET uh, transistor, or you would use uh, a, a vacuum tube like this. I'm not sure whether they made uh, JFET or MOSFET transistors in the Soviet Union back in the day. But uh, in this oscilloscope, they use a vacuum tube to get the 1 mega ohm uh, input impedance. So after the high impedance uh, valve, everything else is transistorized and uh, these are just basic gain stages all the way through and uh, as you can see uh, there are a lot of capacitors here splitting the low voltage from the high voltage portion of the circuit and of course after all the amplification here this is uh, basically driving the Y deflection plates on the CRT so that explains the circuit here um, apart from that we have a little circuit down here which is part of the voltage regulator circuit as I was talking about uh, when we were seeing the other side of the oscilloscope, the mains comes in down here, goes to a transformer, gets rectified, and then we have the voltage regulator circuit down here. Um, this is the old school way of doing things. Uh, it's basically some Zena diodes and some uh, power transistors. And uh, the power transistors are these two up here. These are uh, in a Darlington pair. So let me just show you the CRT before I cover up this oscilloscope again. So here's a top view of the oscilloscope. Um, unfortunately one of the threads has gone on these screws here so I can't remove the top piece and uh, easily get to the CRT. But uh, I think you can see it down here. And it's basically one long glass tube. 
with all the connections coming out from the back except for one wire it looks like uh, down here which would be uh, a high voltage wire and uh, anyway there's a big long coil here and I'm not quite sure what this is for because when I look at the schematic there isn't really anything that looks like it requires such a long coil the only thing I could think of is for the oscillator that generates the high voltage um, but I don't know why that would require such a long coil but uh, anyway uh, that's what it looks like so if we try and look at the components and try and compare this to Western technology from roughly the same age um, it actually looks very similar uh, the components of course are different types but the way of doing stuff with a gigantic wire harness and components on PCBs there's really not much difference there which is kind of interesting if we zoom in here we can take a look at the components from what I see they have date codes from around 1979 um, some 1978 some 1979 so this oscilloscope should be built around that time so yeah of course you wouldn't build equipment like this today um, but uh, back in the day this was uh, the norm in fact if you look at the wire harness uh, everything is tied together with a maybe one or two centimeter distance with something that looks like dental floss I remember when I went to university and was uh, learning electronics uh, that was also the way we, we were taught back then uh, when doing wire harnesses I don't think people learn this today but uh, I guess I was one of the last generations learning how to uh, tie wire harnesses with dental floss just to give you an idea of how old I am and here we have another couple of components which are kind of interesting these are high voltage diodes and uh, I've never seen a package like that before another thing is that all the transistors are socketed which indicates that they must have been really expensive back then I've actually visited a Russian semiconductor factory in the early 90s in uh, Novgorod and back then they were making uh, transistors for the Russian space program and um, they were still using packages like this so that was kind of interesting I don't know what kind of yield they had but for the space program if they just had one transistor working perfectly out of a thousand that would be good enough yeah so that that really ties in with um, some of my uh, early, earlier experience so let's finally take a look at these uh, glass diodes here and uh, obviously they are high voltage diodes they are used to generate the high voltage for accelerating the electrons in the CRT they're all made from glass and screwed into the chassis itself and they are also a package that I have never ever seen before also while we're at it we can see that this, all the solder joints have been uh, lacquered afterwards with some red lacquer this is also a construction technique I haven't seen before it's like either you use wire wrap and lacquer or you uh, solder it and uh, you don't really need to lacquer it but they must have a reason for doing this so anyway it's quite a standard construction for the 1970s and yeah that's it thank you for watching